Hello, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Burn Your Draft, an exploration of the Reed College senior thesis process and experience. I'm your host, Frank Tangerlini, and this week we'll be talking with Ryan Kogler. You don't have to look too far to see the topic of this thesis. Today we'll be hearing from Ryan on land pricing in Portland. We should start by just introducing yourself. Tell me about, tell me who you are, what major you're in, and a little bit about your quarantine. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so my name's Ryan Kobler. Um, I'm from Sacramento, California, and I'm writing my thesis in math and economics. Um, and as far as quarantine is going, it's definitely um, disappointing. I think uh, just sort of, because this is such like, I guess like an important year. And I do feel like we as collectively as the class of 2020 have been robbed of like a sense of closure. My mom had the audacity to say, why didn't you just have a run fair over Zoom? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, my mom was like, uh, "When you when you come home, you can I can spray you with champagne," um, and we the same. And I thought it was really sweet, um, but it, I think it's also something that's like hard for people to understand too. Um, so it's yeah, it's like definitely disappointing. But um, I don't know. I I also feel pretty lucky in like in my major and just in sort of the state of my thesis at this point, because um, it wasn't really affected by the quarantine at all. Um, All of my stuff was like online and I've just been like glued to my computer. So it really didn't make much of a difference. I could still do all of my analyses and stuff online, um, but I did really feel like bad for for friends that use um, on-campus resources and labs. Yeah, that's good to hear that you're still able to work on yours. So tell me a little bit about your thesis. What What is it? Um, so it's about a uh, land valuation in Portland. Um, so I'm working with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability and my, uh, with the city of Portland. And my thesis answers like a tiny question in sort of a broader realm of how should cities be arranged and how should Portland be arranged? Um, um, and because Portland has like a pretty diverse geographic landscape, um, we're close to Mount Hood. We have like within city forests and slopes and mountains and things like that. Um, there's a lot of environmental diversity that didn't happen by accident. And those things um, were specifically like planned and designed into Portland sort of from the get go. And so what I'm looking at is basically how these building regulations um, and geographic constraints affect property values in Portland. And basically I'm, I'm working them with, with uh, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability to find out how much these geographic constraints actually prevent people from building in the city. How other than just them being there, do they restrict buildings in the city? Um, So, I mean, so a developer will have to pretty much um, comply with all of like the restrictions um, within like a certain tax lot. Um, And so in that way, and some of the the restrictions are like uh, how tall your building can be or where you're able to build. And so there are specific, I guess, pockets of Portland that city planners try to preserve Um, just to stay in accordance with state law. Um, And the question is important um, for the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. In order to figure out how to plan for the future, they want to see like where developers are going to develop next. And so this is one of the reasons they want to say like, okay, so how much does this geographic constraint actually constrain building? Like how is, how much is this actually preventing people from building here and it's sort of 
to answer the question of how to allocate resources within the city, especially considering that Portland is growing in population. Is there a specific reason you chose Portland? Um, so the question was actually like posed to my thesis advisor. She had worked with the um, city of Portland on previous projects. So, um, and Noelle, I think just thought that this would be like a good thesis topic. So um, I guess my pathway to this research question was a little bit unusual in that sense um, because the research question was already defined. Um, and another thing that I would say is a little bit unusual um, is that the, pro the project focused on looking at different building types in Portland. And so it was a pretty big project. So we got to break it down into two people. And so Noel asked um, me and another student named Salma um, to work collaboratively on it for a bit, which is also sort of different because usually you're just like toiling away by yourself. But it was actually really nice to be able to have somebody else to work with, um, to code with. Um, but it ended up with two separate theses at the end. I could see how bouncing off ideas between each other would also maybe help with things. What was the outcome of your project? Um, basically, I got a table of prices um, for all of these non-market environmental constraints um, that aren't traditionally traded on the market. So that was kind of cool. Like I got to see like exactly how much living in a flood zone affects the property value of houses, which was pretty cool. Um, and so, yeah, so I got both of these tables for single family houses, but also like apartment um, complexes as well. Um, and one of the interesting things I found between the two, um, which sort of makes, I mean, which makes sense in hindsight, um, is that multifamily houses tend to value accessibility more. Like it matters more um, than single family houses. Um, and I also found that not all of the constraints actually negatively influence property values. Um, so there were things like being located on the Willamette Greenway, which is right next to the river, um, even though there are building restrictions there. Um, it was sort of like the river, like the benefit of living near the river outweighed that. Um, so I found that to be pretty interesting. How did you determine those prices? I used a few different statistical methods to figure it out. Um, something so that like so a market doesn't exist for these constraints. So you link it to a market that does exist. So we linked it to the housing market um, and you basically decompose all of the components of the house into a regression. Um, and so you'll have stuff like the number of bedrooms, um, number of bathrooms, square footage, and things like that um, in order to isolate the effect of the environmental constraints you're talking about. Was this the outcome that you expected when you started the thesis? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess because the question was redefined, I mean, was um, predefined, this was totally um, what I expected and what was sort of asked of us as well. Um, and so the city of Portland will then take all of these prices and use them in their predictive model to sort of plan for the future. That's cool. Could this form of statistical analysis and this kind of thesis be used in other cities? Um, that's a good question. I don't think that it can because we got all of our data from Portland specifically. And traditionally, this kind of analysis requires that you focus on a particular area and time. So this probably wouldn't even apply to before 2015 because you can think of them as different markets entirely. That's interesting. Yeah, a lot of times you'll observe like 
different effects in different places. And it's kind of interesting to figure out like what is driving those differences between cities. Do you know any other effects off the top of your head? <laughs> it's sort of, <laughs> it's a little bit boring, <laughs> but like I know that um, uh, noise matters differently um, in Paris than it does in Portland. Um, I think there's a smaller impact of how noise um, affects property values, um, just depending on what residents are used to and willing to accept. So if you're in like a louder city, um, you might not expect um, negative effects of noise on houses. Yeah, I live in a pretty loud city. I actually miss the noise whenever I go to Portland. So did you have any unexpected challenges? Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I guess a big part of the thesis was figuring out how to stitch together all of the data. So we started with a plan of what variables we thought would be important. So stuff again, like, like the bathrooms, um, but also traffic and accessibility and in Portland, maybe like a bikeability as well. And so had to go to different sources in order to get that data. Um, we got all of the data through our connection at um, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability who, who, like, who sent and emailed us all of the data, but it wasn't joined together. So a huge part of it was joining together like the dozen uh, data sets that we had and figuring out how to get them all to refer to the same house that we were looking at. And this data also had a spatial component. So normally, I guess you would think of data as being a series of rows and columns, um, but the spatial component actually gave you shapes and like maps um, associated with each house. And we had never worked with that before. Um, <laughs> So it was fun to figure out how to connect everything together. It was kind of like building a puzzle. So is the city of Portland gonna use this data? Basically what we're doing is making an input to their model. Um, and so that's also one of the reasons I chose to do um, this thesis was just because it seemed like it would be directly applicable to policy decisions in Portland. Wow, you have a lasting impact. <laughs> Did you acquire or strengthen any skills during this experience other than your communication skills that you had said? I would say off of that, um, definitely documentation. This was a, there were a lot of moving parts as it probably sounds like. Um, so it was important to keep my like code organized um, and sort of structured in a way that made sense for the people that were looking at it. Um, Salma and I would code together um, and sometimes separately. So it was important that when we were making changes to our code um, that we like understood what was going on and that it could be replicated. Um, so there were kind of like constant checks on like how good the documentation was. Um, which I think helped maintain like the organization of the project. Uh, yeah, that makes sense that it would help maintain that. Um, how did you, sorry, my dog is barking. Um, how did you divide the work between you and Selma? <laughs> what questions were you trying to each answer? So we were trying to answer the same question, again, to, um, to quantify each of the constraints. Um, but we divided the results in terms of like how we wanted to quantify it. So we had different modeling approaches and we also focused on different building types. Uh, Salma did mixed use buildings. So if you have like a, like a coffee store on the bottom and apartments on the top. Um, and I focused more on just full apartment complexes. Um, and we both worked on single family houses as well. Um, so that was how it was different. And there was a lot of overlap just in the data, getting everything joined and together. So we faced a lot of those same problems with the data together, but um, took the modeling approaches alone. How do you think 
your thesis experience will inform your life after read? So I think that this thesis helped um, open a door in an area of econometrics that I'm interested in, um, specifically like working with spatial data. There are so many different ways that you can work with it. Um, and so I'm excited to start to focus a little bit more on that um, and see what I can dig and, and learn about. Uh, do you have plans for after read? So I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be moving to Philly to uh, work as a research assistant at the Federal Reserve. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And I think that um, it's going to be like academic research is going to be revising um, the economists work there. Um, and I think that uh, just sort of maintaining, I guess, good organization habits and good communication habits will be really important um, in that job. Um, even though I think that uh, we're going to study different things. I don't have any more questions for you. I hope everything goes well with your oral presentations. Thanks. Yeah, I can't wait to see what Portland does with your data. <laughs> Me too. I'm I'm excited. And thank you for for all of your emails and stuff. It's been kind of fun to prepare for this. I'm happy about that. Um <laughs> it's been great talking with you. Thank you, Ryan, for your time and for telling us about your thesis and the amount and kinds of work that went into it. Thank you for listening, and I hope you join us again to talk to more seniors about their thesis and better understand why you'd want to burn your draft. Burn Your Draft is a production of Reed College and the Center for Life Beyond Reed, created jointly by students, alumni, and staff. This episode was produced and engineered by me, Reed College student Frank Tangerlini. Our executive producer is Seth Paskin, class of 1990, with technical advising from staff member Joe Janiga. Nate Martin, staff member and alumnus, is our project manager. Music by student Jack Salvucci and podcast art by student Henry Gotchlik. This podcast was made possible by a gift from Seth Paskin.